This week on the GCN Racing News Show, what is the ideal height and weight to be a Tour de France winner? We've seen some trends over the last few decades and they're very interesting indeed. We'll also be looking back at highlights of the National Championships week, who won what and which teams were most successful. We've got news on the Women's Tour de France set to start next year, some high profile absentees from the Men's Tour de France and all your other racing related news too. First up though, I was sent some really interesting research by Petter Minerik last week, who's been delving through the history books to track all sorts of metrics, overall distance, average stage distance, average race speeds, but also the heights and weights of winners of Grand Tours, which I found particularly interesting. We'll put a link in the description below to the whole article, but let's take a look at some of the specifics. First up, the heights of the Grand Tour winners. Here, the line of best fit shows that the height of the winner of the Giro has remained fairly consistent over the years, about 1m77 or just under 5'10". At La Vuelta, the trend is for taller riders to succeed in the general classification, but that trend is even more visible at the Tour de France. Is that by chance, with Froome, Wiggins and Thomas skewing the more recent data, or is that a sign of things to come? Now, you would imagine that with a tendency to taller riders, the average weight of Grand Tour winners would be increasing slightly too. But the opposite is in fact true. The trend is even more pronounced with weight. Now, the caveat to all this data is that, well, firstly, some of it is missing, particularly from the early winners of the Grand Tours, but also in terms of the accuracy of height and weight data online. However, the more recent data should be reasonably accurate, and it shows that from 1980 to 2000, the average Grand Tour winner weighed 67.67 kilograms, whilst in the 20 years after that, the average was down to just 64.33. Now, putting those two graphs together, Petter was then able to track BMI of Grand Tour winners over the years. Here, you can see that the general trend in all three Grand Tours is that the BMI has been declining amongst the winners at quite a fast rate, going from the middle of what doctors would look at as normal and heading towards a BMI that they would see as underweight and therefore unhealthy. Now, according to the data that Petter analyzed, Fabio Aru had the lowest BMI of any Grand Tour winner when he won La Vuelta in 2015 at 18.81. Health professionals would class anything under 18.5 as being underweight. Now, Petter also looked at the heights and weights of the King of the Mountains classifications at the three Grand Tours. And interestingly here, each race is quite different. So the average weight and height of the winner of that competition at La Vuelta is going up. At the Tour de France, the weight has remained quite similar whilst the height has gone up. And at the Giro, both the height and weight has gone down. Now, you might think that's because of the steepness of the climbs over in Italy, but of course, La Vuelta has found some horrific gradients in recent years too. The overall BMI trend, though, is downwards in all of the tours, and the same is the case for the winners of the points classification. Why is that? Well, I guess there's lots of reasons. Science has advanced almost exponentially when it comes to sporting performance, and so long as a gradient is a thing, weight is going to impact the results of bike races. And with that science has come knowledge on both training and diet, allowing riders and teams to carefully monitor and track everything they're doing and everything they're eating. The problem with this trend is its effects on general cyclists. The poster boys and girls of our sport are stick thin, ridiculously lean, and so the quest to be like that can lead to all sorts of eating disorders, and that goes for pros and amateurs alike. However, one of the things I like most about our sport is the difference in size, weight, and shape of riders in the same peloton. Brad Wiggins is the tallest Tour de France winner at 1m90. Magnus Bagstedt won Paris-Roubaix and got himself over the mountains of Grand Tours at over 90 kilograms. Whilst at the other end of the spectrum, you've got riders like Jose Rujano, barely half the weight of Bagstedt, and Nairo Quintana, just 1m67, but a true titan of the sport. They may be statistical trends, but the beauty of cycling is that it offers variability of terrain to suit almost everybody. It's like watching Usain Bolt in the same race as Mo Farah. Wouldn't really happen in athletics, certainly not as much, but it does in our world, and it's another reason that I absolutely love this sport. Okay, we should probably move on to some actual racing now, shouldn't we? 
Last week, a whole host of national championships took place around the globe, which means, as ever, we are unable to go through every single winner and every single standout performance. However, I have picked out a few of the standout performances, and I'll start with the races, which we had live on GCN Plus, the Spanish and French national champs. Check out this lead out from Omar Fraile. It's a lead out being taken on here by Omar Fraile, and now it's going to be Alex Aramburu. Alex Aramburu waiting, but Fraile's got a gap. Fraile's got a gap, and Fraile's going all the way, Omar Fraile going all the way, Omar Fraile is the winner of the Spanish national title. A lead out so good, nobody could come around him. Astana had strength in numbers at the Spanish men's nationals and looked to be setting it up for Alex Aramburu for an uphill finish which suited him down to the ground. I'd imagine that letting the wheel of Fraile go was a deliberate move on Aramburu's part, but it didn't matter either way. Fraile took his first title with an incredible display of raw power, with Jesus Herrada taking silver and Aramburu the bronze. The time trial title came down to just hundreds of a second. Jon Izaguirre breaking David de la Cruz's heart, eight hundredths of a second was the exact margin of victory. In the Spanish women's road race, check out this for some sportspersonship. It was uh, on this exit of the roundabout as she took the right hand and it just looks like it just lost her front wheel. Oi, oi. Deary me, they've both almost gone down there. Mavi Garcia, and that's nice, she's waiting. Anais Atesteban wiping out on a right hand bend. Mavi Garcia waiting for her to remount and to rejoin. How cool is that? Garcia would later manage to take the win solo, adding to the time trial win from just 24 hours previous. One of a number of riders, in fact, to have done the double. Nobody managed that in the French elite championships, though. Audrey cordon Rago won the time trial title, but was unable to defend her road title, although it was very close. Here's the finish. Is it going to be elite national title for Evita Muzik? And the hands on the tops. Audrey cordon Rago trying to get back into the mix now as Gladys Verholz tries to come alongside. And it's going to be a victory for Evita Muzik. Audrey cordon Rago misses out. Gladys Verholz takes that one. But the young rider from FDJ, she played the waiting game. She played it absolutely perfectly there, Danny. Evita Music taking her first elite national title at the age of just 22. She won a stage of the Giro Rosa last year, so she's definitely the real deal. In the men's time trial, pre-race favourite Remy Cavagna had a mare, having to swap bikes twice, and that allowed a clean sweep of the podium for Groupama FDJ, with Benjamin Toma taking the win two years after he last managed that same feat. Cavagna got his own back in the road race on Sunday. The three-man De Koenig quick-step squad was up against it, you've got to say, given the size of the other teams on the start line, and in particular, the 143 riders taking part from Groupama FDJ. However, De Koenig came out on top. Most eyes were on Alaphilippe, of course, but Cavagna made the early breakaway group and dispatched with them all on the last lap in characteristic style. In Belgium, Lotta Kopecky retained both her road and time trial titles, despite not feeling good in the road race, whilst Wout van Aert took the men's road race. And it was the opposite, really, to the French men's road race, in that a small Jumbo Visma team were up against the might of de Koenig Quickstep, but still won out. He narrowly outsprinted Ed Turns of Trek Segafredo, whilst Remco Evenepoel was disappointed in third. And he had finished runner-up to his teammate, Eve Lampart, in the time trial a few days before, Lampart winning in his hometown to the delight of his home fans. I love that reaction from the local fans. Uh, De Koenig Quickstep also took the Portuguese national time trial title with João Almeida, which in itself wasn't a surprise. The surprise to me was that it marked his first ever pro win. I had to double check that fact as I found it so hard to believe. Uh, Jumbo Visma were the most successful of the pro teams at the national championships. They won in Norway with Foss, in the Netherlands with Timo Rosen, and they took three time trial titles too. Foss again in Norway, Tony Martin in Germany, his 50th pro win against the clock, and Tom de Moulin back to the top step of the podium in the Netherlands national championships. Over in the USA, Amber Naben finished second in the time trial at the age of 46 and off the back of a 10-day training block in which she covered a thousand miles. She told Cycling News she lacked a bit of sparkle after all those miles, which is not surprising, but what an incredible ride. 
The day, though, marked the return to competition and to winning ways for Chloe Dygart of Canyon SRAM, who now seems on course for her Olympic dream. The road race was won by Lauren Stevens, whilst in the men's it was Lawson Craddock in the time trial and Joey Roscoff in the road race. In Italy, Elisa Longo Borghini retained both of her titles. She's just a level above in that country right now. But there was an upset in the men's time trial because Filippo Ganna didn't win or even get on the podium. Matteo Sobrero of Astana continued his run of good form with a surprise win there, while Sonny Colbrelli did the same thing in the road race. He's basically climbing like Tadej Pogaccia at the moment, so watch out for him on the first weekend of the Tour de France. Other riders will be wearing their national champs kit at the Tour, including Natas Konobolovas, who won in Latvia, Tom Schoins, who doubled up in Lithuania, and then three for Bora Hansgrohe. Patrick Conrad won in Austria, Max Schachmann in Germany, whilst Peter Sagan took his seventh national road title, which means that the Sagans have won that event for the last 11 years in a row, and that once again, Peter Sagan won't be in trade team kit for a good while. Marlon Rousset was another rider to do the double, taking the time trial and road race in Switzerland. And to finish, Tadej Pogacar could only manage third in the time trial and fifth in the road race in Slovenia. They were won by Trapnik and Mohoric respectively, both of Bahrain victorious. Now I know there are a lot of winners and big performances that I've missed out, but it's just so hard to cover them all. There's so many races on National Championships week. Right then, what's coming up on GCN Plus this week? The Tour de Bloody France is on, that's what. Uh, the first of the 21 stages is this coming Saturday, and before that, we've got the team's presentation on Thursday evening. So if you're in Europe or Asia Pacific, except for Australia, New Zealand, China, or Japan, you'll be able to watch all of it live on GCN+. So there are more restrictions than we had for the Giro d'Italia, for which I apologize, but if you are in one of those countries where you can watch it with us, we would love to have you on board for the entire three weeks. All of it is ad-free, uninterrupted, and on demand, plus there will be long and short form highlights. And along with all of that, we're going to have a Tour de France hub in place on the GSIN app, which is available to everybody and free to everyone. So as per usual, on the Race TV tab, we'll have our stage previews, route info and rider profiles, etc. But there will also be a ton of stuff for you to interact with on our new Tour de France feed. Keep an eye out for that in the main menu bar across the top of the app's homepage in the next couple of days. Everything tour related, apart from the live racing, will be found there. So news, trivia, stats, quizzes, polls, and much more. And we are also encouraging you to get involved and post your personal tour memories to this feed. That might be a photo of you meeting your cycling hero at the race a few years ago, you and your mates riding an iconic tour climb, or perhaps just a shot of you watching the race from the comfort of your own sofa with your favorite beer in hand. Anything that's special to you, basically, we want to see it all. To do that, just make sure you add the hashtag, Tour de France 2021, so hashtag TDF 2021. Add that to your photo when you upload it to the app and we'll share the best ones on the GCN show and GCN racing news shows over the duration of the tour. So make sure you get posting. But it's not all about the Tour de France this week because before that starts, we've got the four-day Women's Lotto Belgium Tour featuring stars such as Lorena Vibes, Audrey Cordon Rigo, and Alice Barnes amongst others. And that race will be live in all GCN Plus territories. You'll just need to check on the app for the timings of each stage. Beyond that, we have got a documentary coming out this week that I am hugely excited about. So we were fortunate enough to go behind the scenes with Mike Woods and the Israel Startup Nation as they tackled Flesh Wallon and Liège Baston Liège back in April. So here's a sneak peek as to what you can expect. And it's now the grind begins. The very name of the place is written so many times upon the road as if we needed any kind of reminding. And here we go, time to stretch your legs. They say the Muir is the slowest kilometer in cycling. Um, and in many ways that's true, uh, especially um, when you're on a bad day. Uh, it feels like it's forever. I honestly can't wait for you to be able to watch that one and to give you feedback. They gave us a lot of behind the scenes access and insight, and so we're very grateful to them. We'll move on now, though, to the news that Zwift are going to be headline sponsors of the Women's Tour de France next year, which is great news. As previously mentioned here on the Racing News Show, the race is going to be eight days long, with stage one on the same day as stage 21 of the Men's Tour de France in Paris. 
Having such a high profile sponsor will no doubt help to get the race off to the best possible start. And further to Zwift, ASO also announced last week that Le Credit Lyonnais will be sponsoring the leader's yellow jersey. And the most important part of that is that the leader of the race will receive themselves that cuddly line on the podium. I don't know how a cuddly line became so iconic and coveted, but it is. I'd love to have one myself. Leclerc are sponsoring the Queen of the Mountains jersey. Live Racing will sponsor the Best Young Riders jersey. And Tissot will take care of all the timekeeping. I'd imagine the race would quickly jump to being the most prestigious on the women's calendar. It's about time they had a blue ribboned event, and it's now just 12 months away. Moving on, as well as the national championships, there was also another pro race on last week, the Adriatica Ionica. It marked Elia Viviani getting back to winning ways. He won the first and the last of the three stages, quite comfortably on the first one after a masterclass lead out from the Italian national team for whom he was riding at the race. But Jakob Moretko pushed him very close on the final stage. We had to wait for a photo finish to really be sure as to who had won. The overall GC though was played out on stage two, which finishes up the Chima Grappa. With three Ks to go, Lorenzo Fortunato found himself in a six-man group with two from Astana and three from Bardiani CSF. It was a very dramatic finale with Pronsky away for Astana, then teammate Kudus overtaking him. Here are Declan Quigley and Magnus Bagstedt calling the final few hundred meters. Well, Fortunato is either a very cool customer indeed, or he's almost out in his wheels because no instant response from him, no instant response too from Giovanni Carboni, the 25-year-old uh, Italian from the Bardiani CSF squad, from the uh, six riders in the group for much of the hill, the four that have been there for the, in recent times, they're down to just one, and Carboni's not oh, equal to it. As here he comes, to go. For Fortunato is straight past Bronski, straight on to but how he could us look at the run to the finish line here. He's finding something extraordinary and what about that for pouncing on the line inside the closing meters he gets across the gap and times it to absolute perfection nail biting stuff and another big win for fortunato off the back of that amazing ride on the slopes of the zonkalan at the giro d'italia no doubt he's got lots of offers on the table right now but from what i've read he's going to stay with the yolo committee team who've got some lofty ambitions over the next few years in other news, as a number of teams have now released their Tour de France rosters, there have been some big surprises in terms of both inclusions and exclusions. I will start with the latter. Marc Padon has not been selected for Bahrain victorious, which was a big surprise to me and to many others. His climbing at the Dauphiné, where he won the final two stages, was absolutely exceptional. And if he was anywhere close to that form at the Tour de France, he'd have had a very good chance of a stage win. Uh, the team, though, is going to be led by Jack Haig for the GC and Sonny Colbrelli for pretty much everything else, given the form that he's in right now. Pascal Ackerman was snubbed by his team, Bora Hansgo, despite apparently being given a guarantee from team manager Ralph Denk that he would be competing there this year when he signed his contract a few years ago. That, though, a decision I can understand a bit more. Ackerman has not won a single race so far this year, and the team also needs to cater to the ambitions of both Peter Sagan and Wilco Kelderman. John Dagenkolb and Tim Welland are not on Lotto Soudal's lineup. The decision on Dagenkolb appears to be on purely sporting grounds, whereas Welland has not been feeling himself recently, and so he's going to head for scans to see if they can pick out what the problem is. And it's a similar case for Bob Jungels of AG2R. He was removed from their squad, and his problem already has been diagnosed. He will shortly be treated for endofibrosis, which is likely what has been causing him to underperform in recent times. On to the surprise inclusion, and a very nice surprise it is too. Andre Greipel will be competing at his 11th Tour de France this summer, this time for the Israel startup nation. The big German has had a bit of a resurgence of form this year with two wins in the last couple of months, and the team will be hoping he'll pick up his 12th Tour de France career stage win this year. If he did it, it would be his first at that race in five years. I think we'd all love to see that, wouldn't we? There was also a few retirement announcements last week. Kevin Retzer, a pro for 12 years, will hang up his wheels at the end of 2021, saying that he's just not willing to take the same type of risk that some of the youngsters do these days. He never won a pro race in his career, which has been almost entirely devoted to helping others. TJ Van Garden has already ridden his last race. The American chose to finish his career after the US National Championships at the weekend, where he was third in the time trial. He was, for many years, America's next big hope when it came to Grand Tour success. Hype that started when he won the Best Young Riders jersey and finished fifth overall at the Tour de France in 2012 at the age of just 23. 
He took a total of 16 wins in his career, including the GC at the Tour of California and twice at the Tour of Colorado. And finally, Brent Bookwater will finish his career at the end of this year as well, after 14 years as a pro. He took stage wins in Qatar, the Tour of Utah and the US Pro Challenge, but like Retzer, spent most of his career working for others, including Cadell Evans when he won the Tour de France in 2011. Moving on, there will be a new name and a new kit for Total Direct Energy at the Tour. They will, from this point forward, be known as Team Total Energies. Uh, this is their new kit. I like the shorts and I like the jersey, just not together. Not sure why, uh, but you can get your vote in on that as well. We've got a poll going over on the GSIN app. Hot or not to that brand new kit. Meanwhile, Fabio Jakobsen doesn't have any new kit, but he does now have new teeth, 10 of them to be precise. And he showed them off on social media last week. Having lost four teeth and had implants myself, I know firsthand how long and how hard the process of dental implants is. And that for Jakobsen was probably the easiest of the operations he's had to go through over the last year. Still find it remarkable he's back on his bike at all, let alone racing, but he's progressing uh, very well. He was 29th at the Dutch National Championships yesterday. Chris Froome has been getting in some big rides ahead of the Tour de France. He posted a 237 kilometer, eight hour, 40 minute ride to Strava last week, where he took in over 5,000 meters of climbing over in the French Alps. And finally, a couple of transfer rumors going around at the moment, one of which is Rowan Dennis set to leave Ineos Grenadiers and move to arch rivals Jumbo Visma. Uh, the Australian was left out of the Ineos Grenadiers tour roster, but his big goal for the season this year is the Olympic Games. Alexander Vlasov, meanwhile, has been linked with Bora Hansgrohe, and Alexander Kristoff is moving away from UAE Team Emirates at the end of this year, and potentially to Intermarché Wanty Gobert. Okay. It's been another long one this week, I think. Uh, don't forget to check out our big Tour de France preview show, which is coming out tomorrow. All the stages, most of the riders, dates for your diaries, and much more. I look forward to seeing you then, and then on Saturday for the start of the biggest race in the world. I can't wait. Goodbye for now, though.